Pacheco, known to boxing fans around the world as the Fight Doctor, will be your host as we visit his 12 greatest rounds of boxing and their untold stories with his guests, Judge Mills Lane, trainers Emmanuel Stewart, Teddy Atlas, Angelo Dundee, and Lou Duva, and authors Roger Kahn and Tom Hauser. In the ring, man's most courageous, noble, and dark traits are revealed with naked clarity. And now, we'll see how boxing's greatest icons stood up to their toughest tests. During this show, create your own list of how these rounds should be ranked. And at the end of this special, we'll reveal the Fight Doctor's all-time rankings. Whether you agree or disagree, send your comments and rankings to the email address listed at the end of this show. And now, Ferdy Pacheco's 12 Greatest Rounds. Dempsey versus Willard. The Massacre. 1919 round one on july 4th 1919 just eight months after america's victory in world war one the potawatomi giant 37 year old jess willard and 24 year old challenger the manassa mauler jack dempsey meet in a jerry rigged wooden arena on a steamy searing day in toledo ohio 1919 america is a vortex of labor unrest and radical social change Despite President Wilson's two vetoes, the Volstead Act is approved by Congress and ratified by the states, introducing prohibition and increasing misery for returning GIs, many of whom can't find jobs in a labor market paralyzed by strikes and high inflation. America is roiling, but a wily promoter named Tex Rickard has just the ticket. A heavyweight championship match between Jess Willard, a champion more interested in a budding Hollywood career, fighting just once in the past three years, and an intelligent and committed challenger, Jack Dempsey, who spent most of his young adulthood mixing boxing with work as a miner, dishwasher, farmhand, brothel bouncer, cowboy, and hotel porter. Willard knows that a great fight needs a villain, and in Wild Jack Dempsey, he has the archetypal bad guy. Dempsey has a cagey flim-flam man as a manager, Doc Kearns, a manipulative genius. Kearns has taken a wiry, tough, light heavyweight who fought in mining camps, carnivals, and barges in winner-take-all bouts and made him a convincing contender with a string of more than 10 knockouts, creating a fighter who the press portrays as a wild animal, a tiger. Classified 4A as the principal supporter of his father, mother, widowed sister, and ex-wife Maxine, a notorious prostitute, Dempsey avoids military service and the public hates him for it. Forgetting that Willard, a father of five, is also exempt from service. Doc Kearns is to blame for the public's disdain of his fighter after posing Dempsey in a freshly pressed worker's uniform, replete with shine shoes and spats. For the next decade, Dempsey enters his fights to cat calls of slacker. Well, it's an honor to have with us a man that knows more about Dempsey than just about anybody left alive of that era. That's Roger Kong, and thank you for coming on. He's written this wonderful book, The Flame of Pure Fire. Anything you want to know about Dempsey, it's in this book, and then a little bit more. All right, let's go to the tape and watch this destructive machine that Jack Dempsey is. Here he's pummeling. Uh, Willard, that's the second of the, of the two knockdowns. He's been down. Now watch Dempsey. Dempsey doesn't go very far, and he winds up with that right hand and now with both hands. And lands every punch. Doesn't miss. Incredible accuracy. Now watch Dempsey here. He even walks around the referee. Look, look, he walks around. He wants a better shot at him. He's, and the referee is kind of pushing him off. But look at Dempsey. Whomp, right over the shoulder, and a, and a one behind the head. And the referee again, just well, get out of the way I want to count. Cordy, the referee doesn't want to get hit. Yeah, I'm, I, I can see that. Dempsey just pounding and pounding. That's the way Jack Dempsey fought in the mining camps and the bars and the saloons of the West. And that's the way he's fighting for the heavyweight championship. And what in the world is Willard doing getting up? He has just been massacred. Well, somebody at this point said Willard was a tall fountain of blood. Well, that's what he was. And there he goes down again. Now, watch, watch what happens to him when he gets on the ropes. On the ropes, Dempsey, no mercy. 
No mercy. Never, he just keeps on going. Never look, going look at this. Look at this. On the ropes, halfway out there, and he's still hitting. Okay, now he's, he's going to sort of stagger up here because he just got nothing but guts, Willard. He's a brave man. Up in the kidney. Whoop. Yeah, another one. Another one, and I believe that he's going to sit. Well, here's where it ends. Here's where it ends. There, there, there's nothing left that anybody can do to help him. Yet, he goes back for two more rounds two more because rounds. Dempsey goes out and has to come back. Yes, because of the mistiming. Let me let me ask you a question that's always bothered me. Had Kearns been in Willard's corner as a wily manager that he was and saw Dempsey leave, don't you think Willard would have been the heavyweight champion? Fight's over, fight's over, over, fight's over. Make a lot of noise. And screaming, hollering. Willard was a tightwad. He wouldn't hire the right people. He wouldn't hire good people, so that's there was it. nobody to help him but himself, and he was out of his skull by that point. He had more damage than anyone I've ever seen in 40 years of being a fight doctor. Really? Now, I've taken care of thousands of boxers. Every kind of heavy punching, heavyweight championship fight I've been in with Liston, with Foreman, with, uh, I mean, the guys that can punch, with Tyson. I've never seen this kind of uh, an injury. And for the public that isn't familiar with it, and, and you will be if you read this, here are the injuries. Believe me, this is unbelievable. Here are the injuries. The zygomatic arch, or the cheekbone, was broken in 12 places. The jaw in five or six. Five or six teeth came out with the jaw fractures. You fracture the jaw, the teeth go with it. I mean, <laughs> right. falling, falling out. Rib fractures yes. on, on one side. Nose fracture. Nose, cheekbone, jaw, teeth in one round of three minutes. Now, there has to be some explanation for that. I don't have one. We're not sure. Time has is, 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 been a long Willard, the rest of his life, would point to a dent and say, no human being could dent my bone like that. Exactly. And Willard went to his grave convinced that he was jawed by a, by a crooked fighter. We have to remember in the 21st century where Jack Dempsey came from, a very, very tough America. Exactly my point. An America of mining camps, an America of ride the rods. That's romantic. Get the edge, win at all costs. When he wrote, when he was in the boxcars, he had a fight for his life against homosexual hobos there, whose first wife was a prostitute. He was accused of being a pimp. He was being accused of being a professional rapist of virgins who would then be sent to brothels. Some of this is so. This fellow came from a very tough America that people don't believe existed. Jack did what he had to do to win. I'll tell you, if I may, for a moment, Ferdy, when Johansson was going to fight Patterson a second time, and I went up to see him, and I said, uh, how, would you, uh, how would you handle Johansson's big right hand? And then he was 65. He had fists like Mount Rushmore. He said, how would you? I said, well, I'd crowd him, champ. And he said, well, why would you do that? I said, I'd stay inside the big right hand. He said, I'd like you to show me. And he snapped his fingers, and the busboys in the restaurant moved tables, and there, suddenly there was a ring. He said, take off your jacket. And there I was standing with Jack Dempsey. And I thought, when I was in camp in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, I had about three weeks of boxing lessons that has really equipped me to stand in against Jack Dempsey. And then he said, did I ever show you my old one-two? And I said, no. Well, a left took the hair off my chin and a right under the heart. And I dropped my hands because I could count. And he came out of the left along the chin. I said, that's three. Keep your guard up at, at all, all times. times. Exactly. <laughs> and I'll tell you, as a fight doctor, I'll tell you one thing. I've never seen damage like that in my life. I don't think I'll ever see it if I stay another 40 years in boxing, which I'm relatively sure I won't. Dempsey versus Tunney, fight two, the long count, 1927, round seven. Heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey is as inactive as his predecessor, Jess Willard, defending his title just five times in six years, including a stunning fourth-round knockout of French war hero Georges Carpentier in 1921. Five years later, Dempsey loses a 10-round decision to 29-year-old light heavyweight champion Gene Tunney, and a rematch is set for September 2, 1927, in Chicago. During Dempsey's reign, America prospers with the Dow reaching a high of 202 and unemployment dropping to 3.3%. Mrs. Bertrand Russell defends free love, while Al Capone nets $100 million in the still illegal liquor trade and $10 million in the rackets, a new word in the English vocabulary. As the nation's party climaxes in 1927, 
A sporting event, the highlight of the decade, takes place at Soldier Field in Chicago before 104,943 fight fans who pay a record $2,658,660 to see Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey square off for the heavyweight championship. Just a year earlier, in a torrential downpour on September 23rd, 1926, at Philadelphia's Sesquicentennial Stadium, Jack Dempsey loses all 10 rounds to ex-Marine Gene Tunney, a well-read, highly disciplined fighter from Greenwich Village who has analyzed each of Dempsey's championship fights on newsreels and often at ringside. In defeat, Dempsey, who is now fighting without his longtime manager, Doc Kearns, loses the slacker tag and becomes a hero at last, as boxing fans feel cheated by Tunney's superior tactics, which the public perceives as running and dodging. Fans rally around Dempsey as he prepares for his September 22nd, 1927 rematch with Gene Tunney. Dempsey is in shape, but his 32-year-old legs are less than nimble. Rumors of mob fixing swirl around the fight. Gene Tunney has taken hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans from Philadelphia mobsters, while Al Capone backs Dempsey, despite Dempsey's written plea for him not to interfere. Untrustworthy as he is, Kearns would never have agreed to three fateful stipulations for the fight. One, a large 22-foot ring. This wildly favors Tunney's running style. Two, the long count rule. Upon knocking down his opponent, the fighter must go to a neutral corner before the referee begins to count. This rule is a response to the destruction Dempsey wreaked on Willard. Three, the choice of referee, Dave Barry, who runs a speakeasy dangerously unblessed by Al Capone, favors Gene Tunney. This plays a major role in the long count. Roger and I are going to look at maybe what's one of the most famous scenes in boxing. Dempsey loses his title because he doesn't go to a neutral corner. Now watch, it starts right now. It's a right hand that's going to start this. There's a right hand over the left. Now watch closely because it happens fast. There's a hook, there's a right. One, two, three, four. Boy, that's fast punching. Did you ever see faster hands? Now let's watch this. Not, now there it goes down. He slow motion. Right. Left and right. Now watch the four. It's One. A terrific one. Two. Right. Three. Uh, Four. Right. That's on the way down. No. I mean, how can anybody get up from that in 10, he, he, in 10 seconds? He at can't. this point, he said to Woody Broome later, I began to perceive herringbone. I wondered what was the herringbone. It was the canvas of the ring. Texture of the canvas. Now look where Dempsey is. Dempsey won't go to a neutral corner because all his life he's been fighting this way. Right. He's excited. He's got the guy down. He's been waiting to get him. And he's just standing there. Now, the referee doesn't start to count till now. And you see the day's condition that Tunney's in. He's just now coming to. He's just now realizing he's on the canvas, where he's at. The referee moves over to really give him an, an earful, let him know exactly where he's at. He better start getting up. And, of course, he barely beats the count. Now, he beats the count, no question about it, because he gets to nine and gets up. And then Dempsey comes over like he always does, just chasing after him. But from here on out, it's it's the it's the old uh, alley uh, run 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 uh, while the other guy's chasing. Uh, that film looks a little speeded up to me. Uh, well, one of the terrible uh, problems with making a complete analysis of this is that the film we have is a tenth generation, twelfth generation. They sped it up for the newsreels. The newsreels were very big then, and uh, you just ran it very fast. A round was like two and a half minutes. Right after the fight, Benny Leonard, the great lightweight and champion, and Hype Igo, a very good sports writer at the time, got the film, and they got sprockets and stopwatches, and they timed it and timed it. It took them two weeks for the New York world, and they concluded that Tunney was on the canvas for 17 or 18 seconds. Others have said 14. You get the question, could Tunney have gotten up? Well, I don't think he could have, but if he had, he would have gotten up confused and if you're confused in a ring with Jack Dempsey, you're it's out. over. <laughs> you're out. And some fractures to go with it. When we say a referee is fixed, how, how do you fix a referee? You fix a referee various ways. Give me a couple that you've got in the book. Very well, here's, here's what we have. We have uh, Tunney involved with a, a mob in Philadelphia, Boo Boo Hoff and others. Uh, Westbrook Pegler called Boo Boo Hoff an ominous character. Uh, Capone admired Dempsey. He tried to manage Dempsey. Dempsey had enough sense to back away. He wouldn't let him do it. So Capone was very heavily <clears throat> on Dempsey's side, and there were two referees who were 
being considered. Dave Miller, who not me, but Benny Leonard said was the best referee in the country.